Congratulations. You're listening to Mind Pump, the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment You podcast. did it, you guys. Uh, now, in this episode, we answer fitness and health questions that our audience asked us. Uh, but the way we opened the episode was with an introductory portion, so where we talk about our lives and current events. We talk about some studies. Today's episode, the intro is 37 minutes long. After that, we get into answering the fitness questions. Let me give you a breakdown of the whole podcast. So we open up by talking about the fact that uh, my wife is trying lots of natural methods to try to induce labor. As of the recording of this podcast, no baby yet. Ooh. So we're, yeah, we're, we're waiting. We are anticipating. Then Adam talks about his night at home without wife and kid, and he, ha- he brought out the bong and got emotional. So <laughs> good times. Yeah. Then we talk about uh, a podcast that we listen to on economics and uh, the future of kind of what's going on, where you should invest your money. That was a great conversation. Then we talk about how the 49ers are now working with Juve Red Lights to improve the recovery of their athletes. Mm. I also brought up a study that shows that using red light therapy twice a week uh, through uh, ultrasound shows that collagen density dramatically improves. This stuff really works. It does improve your skin health, the firmness of your skin. It also helps with recovery. No joke, ladies and gentlemen, this stuff is legit. More reasons why the Niners are number one. And uh, Juve is a company we work with, so we have a discount for you. So if you want to get your own home red light Go to juve.com, that's J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash mind pump, and then use the code mind pump. Every order of $500 or more will get a free MAPS Prime program. Um, Then we talked about uh, some of the new flavors from Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is a cereal that you eat at home, tastes like the ones you ate when you were a kid, except there's no sugar and it's high in protein. It's got whey protein in it. It's good stuff. Um, And because you listen to Mind Pump, you also get a big discount. Just go to magicspoon.com forward slash mind pump and then use the code mind pump for the mind pump hookup. By the way, new flavors are in apple, cinnamon, and salted caramel. That's really oh delicious. Oh my God. Then we answered fitness questions. Here's the first one. This person wants to know what we think about plyometrics and how you can incorporate them into their routine. The next question Do deadlifts give you a thicker midsection? The third question was, is it really necessary to take one day off a week from your workouts? And the the final question, uh, they have a nephew that's seven years old who want to start working out. Like, where is a good place to start? What are good exercises and routines that we can recommend for kids? Uh, also, we're in November, which means we have a holiday promotion so right now we're running a ultimate at home bundle. Okay, so these are two amazing workout pro- programs that could be done at home that help you build muscle, boost your metabolism, burn body fat, improve your strength, just get much sexier. Essentially, um, the first program is Maps Anywhere. All you need are resistance bands and a stick. Great workout. The next one is Maps Suspension. All you need are suspension trainers. Both of them are full body workouts. Both of them normally uh, cost a lot more than the promotional rate. In fact, uh, normally you can pay well over $200 for both programs. Right now, get both for $99.99. Hold on a second, actually. There's more. Wait. We're actually throwing in one more program for free, MAPS HIT. So MAPS HIT is a high-intensity interval training program designed to burn a lot of body fat. It's a calorie burner. So one more time, you get MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Suspension, and MAPS Hit, all total for the price of $99.99. Fully loaded. Pay it one time, and you get all three programs. Here's how you sign up. Go to MAPSNovember.com. That's MAPS, M-A-P-S, November.com. And it's T-shirt time. Oh, shit, dog. You know it's my favorite time of the week. (laughs) We have two winners, one for Apple Podcasts and one for Facebook. The Apple Podcast winner is Mark Bacara, and for Facebook, Beth Miller. Both of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Winning! 
Is uh, Baby DiStefano going to happen or what, bro? I know. What's going on here? Oh, man. It's a little... So, as of the recording of this podcast... Don't we're... overcook it, you know? No, I know. As of the recording of the podcast, we are now 11 days past uh, the due date. Wow. Mm. Yeah, so... And, you know, we're, we're trying to do this um, at home. Um, and the law says you can't do this at home if it's two weeks past. So fourteen. So you're three days right now away from not being able to do it at home. Yes. Wow. So the Jess, pressure is on. So Jessica has been given some some natural um, options to help trigger this to go along. Yeah. Would you would you say canola oil or something? No, 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 no. What, no. what do they do? Castor oil. Castor oil. I was gonna say, but that's that what they put in race cars. No. <laughs> is it, no. Castor oil. No. Is it castor? castrol? Oh, castrol. castrol. I knew yeah. I was close, right, hey. Doug? Thank yeah. Castor's from some, some type of bean. I yeah, know. thank God it's not you, yeah, dude. Thank God. <laughs> He's in the garage. I heard castor oil. Oh, yeah. This made the baby come out. Uh, yeah. It oils things I feel up. like it would work, too. No. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> or I'll do what Justin told me last time, scare the shit out of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, um, castor oil is one thing, but we haven't done that yet. So what castor oil is, really interesting, right? It's a laxative, and it's it, there's something in castor oil that attaches to the receptors in your intestines that cause them to contract. And there's similar receptors in the uterus. So when you take mm. it, it causes contractions, and then that can set off the-, the Sort of the catalyst for it all. The right? process, right? But mm. we're not there yet. Okay. There is one other, she's going to be so mad that I'm going to share this, but there is one other, there's one thing that they told her to try first. What's that? Enema. Ooh. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So you do an enema- So has she done it yet? Yeah, she did. It. She did it this morning, and uh, so did you guys have some fun with it? Or no, what? Just, what? Yeah. Fun How the hell do you have fun? <laughs> yeah. It's not. It doesn't what's, sound fun. What's going on here? <laughs> I don't know. How do you have fun with it? I don't know how kinky and weird you are. I figured yeah. you would. You <laughs> not would, that weird, bro. You would turn it into some sort of foreplay. I thought. Yeah. Oh, wow. no? yeah. Hey, babe. Hey. Hey. So, I mean, uh, the only that's the only way I could think. I put some shampoo. Like, otherwise, how do you keep a straight face when you're doing something? I like didn't that? do it. She did it. You know. Oh, she didn't want no help. No, no. Self applied. Yeah. Hey, babe. I put some champagne in the end of a bottle. Tell me if you, if you <laughs> watched the Ben Greenfield uh, uh, video. Yeah, no. So what that does is it stimulates in, intestinal contractions, and then that can set off uh, labor. So she's doing that first. That didn't work. Well, you wait twenty four hours. Oh, yeah. So you. So, so that was l last night or this morning? This morning. Oh, this morning. So she did that. Now, how did you find out she was doing this? Did you walk in and be like, "Honey," or yeah. did she tell you, "I'm going in to go do"? What's this? all this? No, we're all we're on the phone with the midwife and we're talking with her. Oh, so this is like a like a group chat Zoom call yeah. over <laughs> Enema. Yeah. <laughs> No, not while Okay, she now did it. bend over and yeah. slowly insert. Now the instructions are on the bottle. Actually, when you buy the box, it shows like the positions <laughs> to get in. Yes. One of them is on your side. I've seen this. But the other one is like you're like you're doggy style, but with your head hella low. So your butt's up in the air. Yeah, yeah. So I, I <laughs> face, just, face down, ass up. <laughs> yeah, she's like, what the fuck is going on? Now do you use a, is there like I mean I, I have no idea about this. So is it like a funnel and a tube or something? Like what do you it's, what do you uh, insert there? So, oh so I didn't open the box and look at it, but I guess it's a something you fill up with the saline water. So it's like sterile. a funnel, right? It's or not like a, a funnel. It's like a, like I think a bag it's, or something. I think it's like a squeeze thing. Oh, like a, yeah. Right. And then there's a long tube. Like a douche is what it looks like. I guess. Okay. And then there's a long tube with a little end of it, nozzle that's self-lubricated. That's what the box oh. said. And you put it in your butt and then you squeeze the water in. You the fill tube up. comes lubricated already? That, that's what the box said. I don't know. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> no Astroglide or anything like that? No, no. It's, I mean, that's smart. You know, If you ask yeah. me, that's the I mean, that's, capitalism yeah, right there. Yeah. Wow. You know, you would, would you much rather buy the self-lubricated one or the one you have to lubricate? I guess I don't know. I don't know if I trust like somebody else lubricating the thing before I. Do. Maybe, I don't think <laughs> you think there's people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, whoops! Didn't get enough on this uh, one. That should be fine. Yeah. yeah right. You're like, yeah. oh, this oh, this is really dry. Just yeah. spitting on the amp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh my no, god. No. So what you do is you 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 fill your. You know, this is how an enema works, right? You you add water it's just to help people who are constipated. And then you wait, and then when you feel like this is what the box says, when you feel the urge to <laughs> evacuate, yes, then you you sit on the toilet and you let it happen. I feel like that's just gonna happen, yeah, like, whether you like it or not. Now you seem to know some stuff about. As I'm talking, I see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do. I had to do one one time. Oh, <laughs> what? Yeah, what? you yeah. didn't tell us about this. Of yeah, course, you of course, didn't. I wouldn't tell you about this. Like, this, this is like private stuff. He yeah. saved it for the public podcast. Yeah, I just <laughs> figured, like, you know, all, all the rest of the millions of people. Will yeah, know I was gonna now. say, won't tell your boys, but you'll tell a million people. Yeah. Fucking guy, come when on. Did, when did you do this? Yeah, I, I think it was back when I was having issues with my adrenals, and uh, they, 
uh, I don't I don't know if it was that or was I was, I was having some kind of like. Wait, 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 wait a second. You <laughs> stuck something up your ass and you didn't know why. This was for because sure? I don't remember. Dude. You just, let, the you doctor just let some doctor prescribed say, it to me. Oh, that's, hey, that's where isn't that where we're at. Yeah. That's weird to me. <laughs> I just like, like just because a guy has an MD after his name, like honestly, and he says, "Hey, stick this up your ass." Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. No questions. Yeah. No like. Uh, yeah. Could no. That's why because it, it had something to do with the prostate, all that kind of stuff. Like okay. uh, huh? they were checking, dude. This there was an issue. Okay. <laughs> So I don't want to put my medical. That's like, like the engine. You went in the trunk. Data. That doesn't make no sense. Why? What does that have to do with your prostate? <laughs> the prostate. That's how they get to the prostate. Yeah, bro. Come on. Oh, go back okay. to Adam, anatomy. Adam, Adam I haven't had yeah. any fingers in my ass, so I don't know. So <laughs> enlighten, first, enlighten well, me. First of all, that's a you lot. You should try it. It's, yeah. see, here's the, so here's the deal. Adam knows muscles. The rest of the bottom is anatomy. He has no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's like prostate. Like, inner workings yeah. of things. Isn't that nah, your shoulder? No, dude. That's not where it's at. No, when they check your prostate, they you're almost you're gonna hit forty soon, and you are gonna get. At some yeah. point, so I already got mine done. You're gonna so get a good luck. You are gonna get a digit in your butt, and they're gonna check your prostate. It's just yeah. what happens. Wow. What? To, what when do I? This, get this was back to my story. I told you guys this. Where, where that guy he was like uh, from Turkey, and he had these huge hairy fingers. And I, was like, <laughs> I was like really upset about this. Ooh, I was cool. like, isn't there a nurse or something? <laughs> and he was the only one on staff, and and he just like just invaded me. I just picture this. Oh, this, this, this big, this big this, Hungarian yeah, guy with he was like, like, like old fat sausage. <laughs> Fingers. Oh, and, and the worst part was like he was like acting like oh god, like he was all disgusted. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like at least like give me some courtesy here, you know, yeah. like <laughs> make me feel good. Yeah, about make myself. me feel good, like, like pretty or something. What do you want him to tell you? Yeah, like, like, you get a great backside. Yeah, something, dude. <laughs> yes, like I don't there. know, not like ugh, ugh, like like looking away. He did that. Yeah, I'm like you're a doctor for for goodness sake. Be professional about this. He's like I've, I've only been a doctor for two years. I was mechanic and construction worker before. Yeah. my hands are a little strong. I was like, back then my insurance wasn't that great. Yeah, so I'm just gonna put that out. Yeah, there. no, you're gonna have to go through that, Adam. Actually, did you know that? Uh, so the the receptors that cause uh, the prostate to enlarge are the same receptors in the scalp that cause uh, hair loss. So, huh? Yep. So you may be. At higher risk for <laughs> prostate. I like how you brought that oh, around man. to my hair loss. Yeah, that's you might great. have to have a little finger in there. Oh, I got a good doctor recommendation. Figure out what's man. happening. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so she did that, and now um, we're gonna wait and uh, and see what happens. So, yeah. yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. Enough, <laughs> enough finger talk. Dude. Enough Lots finger. of fingers. <laughs> I got some though dad, dad stuff for you. I want to ask you guys. So last night, um, so Katrina's up in Tahoe. I'm last night was a home alone. Night for me, which is awesome. I haven't had that in a, in a long time. So of eating course. Cheetos and uh, I did have a burger. So I, I I ordered a burger. I I even you know what I did that I haven't done in forever. I went and like went into my my storage and stuff and got uh, the bong out. I haven't like took a bong. Oh my god, you hit you a, still bong? Have a bong? I did. Yeah, of course I have a bong. Come wow. on, dude. Yeah, it's, I mean it's stored away though. Like I haven't used it in years, right? So, but I was like, you know what? You just hit the bong. That's, yeah. that's old school. Well, People still do that. You know what it made me think about? I was like, I may not be able to do this for another you know. <laughs> 20 years or whatever that. I better take advantage of this. Use the bong. Yeah. So I went in. I just. You, you imagine your son's a teenager and he walks in. Oh, he opens like, the door. I forgot something. Mom opens the door. Dad's hitting a bong. Yeah. That well, that's why I figured, okay, yeah. this is like one of the few times I might have an opportunity to visit. Now, did it just blast you? Well, I didn't go crazy. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't trying to get totally ripped by myself, but I was like, you know, I was setting the mood for the night. I'm like, I got. Uh, <laughs> Got my my yeah, you had your music on. Yeah, my incense yeah. burning. The music playing. I'm getting you ready your for Costco size movie like, vat of lube. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, dude. Whoa, I, I no, was on one like, too last night. What? Uh, <laughs> you guys we'll, do that? we'll get to your night in a All minute. Right. But what I it actually it was very innocent. What I'm going to share with you guys as I'm setting the, setting the table like it was bad. It wasn't like that. But I'm just this is what I'm doing right. And I, I the reason why I brought that up because I don't know if it was the weed that made me emotional or what, but. I'm watching this new show on Netflix. It just <laughs> I just picture you just crying <laughs> after you hit the box. No, listen, Liz listen. Nipple starts listen, Linda, no. listen, listen, listen. So <laughs> I, I watched Barbarian. Have you guys seen that on Netflix yet? Oh, I, I haven't seen that. Is it good? Yeah, it's a new series, right? So, and it looked really interesting. It was very much so a show that Katrina would not watch with me. So that's what I always try and mm -hmm. choose. Right? If I'm going through, like, if it's my night to pick, and then she's got no say, what am I watching? So Barbarian mm. was the show. And uh, it's it's uh, obviously done somewhere else because they they got the you know the lips not matching up with the, <laughs> subtitles. Yeah, and no 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 subtitles. There's no subtitles. It's like it's done somewhere else. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> another place. It was dubbed. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah the, dubbed. That's the what lips like, didn't yeah. match the words. Yeah. Yeah. What's that called, Sal? Yeah. 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 So I'm watching this right and. 
it gets to a scene. This was weird for me. Right? This isn't. I've never experienced this. And there's a scene where uh, the barbarian, like uh, Rome, comes in and is invading these little small villages, and they're these villages of barbarians. And Rome wants like your firstborn son and and something else, and like your cattle and some shit like that. And like in order to not get your village fucking burned, you have mm. to do this. And so, and I'm watching, and they have this scene where the dad gives his like you know, eight month old or year old son to, to mm. them. And I had never, like, all, like I've, se- I've seen movies like that that have situations like this. It wasn't the first time I'd seen something oh, like this. Yeah. And I get all fucking weird feeling. It's, it's different <laughs> I had to turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> it was so true. Dude, I got all fucking emotional over it and I got angry and it was like, it just ruined my night. And then <laughs> yeah. I, I had to change the movie because it was so- Blow out the candles, turn the lights and back I, on. And I couldn't figure out, was it because- Try and explain that to your single buddies. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I've tried before. Yeah. yeah. I just, it was a weird, it was a weird new feeling that I had never experienced watching a movie like that. And and I don't know if maybe the scene was so long and drawn out or they so emotional because they, you know, showing the dad and him. But it, boy, it just ruined the show for me. Yeah, I yeah. couldn't. I couldn't get into it because because you could relate to the guy, the father who had oh, to give up a son. Because God. now you have a son. That the, the first time that happened to me, my son was I don't know how old he was, six months old. He was a baby, maybe a year old. Mm-hmm. And we're sitting on the couch together, and I got my little boy. You know, sitting. I'm a new dad, and I'm like, oh, Finding Nemo. Let's watch Finding Nemo. It's a, oh, yeah. it's a freaking animated yeah. movie. And when he loses, when the dad, Marlin, loses Nemo in the ocean and the guy, the fisherman, scoops him up, yeah. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Man, Immediate start, pain and yeah, panic. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> I, I start like almost crying. And I'm like, I remember I did the same thing. I, I paused it and my son's looking at me like, why did you pause Yeah, it? I stopped it and I had Dude. to think about like, okay, what I really wanted to th- wrap my brain around, although this would never happen in our society today, but I still had to wrap my brain around like, I w- what would I do? Like, because you have this, so this. What would I do if the Romans came? Right. Well, the the father is like the head of the village, right? So he's got hundreds of people he's responsible for. And this is like, it was a peace offering and treaty Mm -hmm. by giving his son. And so, and it did allow peace for the next 20, 30 years between their village and the Romans. And so. So it's like, don't give my son and everybody dies. Yeah, exactly. Don't give your son, everybody gets murdered or give my son. And then I save the village. And I thought, fuck, Mm -hmm. do I go down and just go down fighting and kill whoever I can? And then everybody's dead because of me or do I literally burn the villages part with my son and allow that and boy I just I was like I couldn't come to grips with what I would do so I, like, I gotta change this shit it was wow. ruining my mood dude yeah. <laughs> it's so it's so true dude you have kids you're you're immediate that's what I mean you know when I always say like your your vulnerability is a parent like mm-hmm. before you were a parent you had no vulnerability. You were you were untouchable. You don't realize it. You think you're not untouchable. Yeah, see, I yeah. think if I, because I've seen scenes like this before, yeah. and I think in the past, I'd be like, ah, oh, fuck that, I'll just kill him or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, don't, I didn't even think twice before. Dude, I remember exactly. So you guys remember the movie 300, of course, right? right? And, and I watched that before, and then I watched it again, you know, after I've had my kids, and it was that same thing, but it was the scene where uh, the one soldier, like his son oh, decided yeah. to go with him into battle. Battle, and then they chop his son's head off and then he just loses shit you oh, know and yeah. i was like oh, oh like man. and that one got me and then like in a totally different way so totally like, yeah, yeah. I, just, I just got the that chills. was a new that was yeah. a very new experience for me for sure i just I w- got the wasn't... chills and almost started crying right now <laughs> 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 all right funny? there's the button I'll, you know I'll, uh, and speaking drop. of which i this function on facebook and you know, i don't know if you go through this justin this or even you doug Facebook will, you know, show you random like flashback photos. Yeah. So like ten years ago, do you know eight years ago? And I just got one. It was eight years ago. It was my son and my daughter at one of my son's uh, soccer games. Mm. That shit gets me emotional. And that's not even sad. That's just an old picture. Yeah. You know, and I see them when you were little. Oh gosh. Yeah, I had one of those with with uh, uh, Ethan. He was like playing guitar and like singing in his little tiny voice. You know, I was like yeah. <laughs> I had to shut it off immediately. Yeah, yeah. I had to stuff that down. We gotta keep, keep the feelings away. Yeah. Keep it away. From I me. totally had a Justin moment too, where I was like, I'm by my. I'm like, stuff that down was exactly how I felt last. Night. Yeah. I was like, I can't I'm by myself. I'm a right professional now. at that. I'm trying to figure out how to not do that. Anymore. What a degenerate! Yeah. I had to look like bong between my legs. I'm sitting here all by myself, <laughs> fucking crying in the living room. Like, oh my god. <laughs> you call it, call it Katrina. Can you come home? Oh my god. <laughs> I don't want to be alone anymore. Oh, oh yeah. god. That yeah. was so new to me. I was not ready for that yeah, at all. That's because yeah. you love your
your kid, man. Well, I mean, yeah, right. I, I hope so. I hope that's all that means. But that was different yeah. for sure. So that's an, it'll be interesting now as like more things like that unfold. How that I'd probably experienced before, never thought twice about that. Well, all I, sudden, I just know. had a mini like feeling of a panic attack last night because I'm getting so close to having another baby, and I'm just and I'm thinking about my kids, and I'm realizing like I just hit the reset button. Yeah, like I got another one. Oh my god! Like, <laughs> and all the all the challenges and the vulnerability, and I'm like I'm adding another one to the mix, and you know I had to uh, calm myself down, like <laughs> you know because at the end, look at the end of the day, it's the most uh, for, I mean at least for me, it's the most valuable meaningful thing I've ever experienced ever. And it, part of it is because it's so damn hard. Hey, did you guys oh, yeah. wa- did you guys watch the uh I sent you all over a podcast uh interview of uh Peter Lineman. Did you guys- Oh, I I watched that. Did you watch the that Economist? Too? Yes. Yes, I did. Justin, yeah. did you get a chance? I watched part of yeah, I didn't I didn't make it all the way through, but I watched like at least half did of it. Did you fall asleep? <laughs> yeah, too much. Yeah, I love bit. that stuff. I knew I you know would. you guys love it. I I, I appreciate it, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't get into as much. Well, as what I, I loved about his conversation was there was there was two different times in there where the interviewer tried to take him in a direction that was he asked him a question that seemed political and he he called him out and said like no that's not economics, mm-hmm. that's politics. That mm-hmm. has nothing to do with that. And then so I really appreciate listening to a very non-biased opinion on our economy like it's yeah one of the hardest things to do is to not like if you cha- tune into a cnn or fox news and they have an economist on there it he's always his messaging is aligned with the network mm-hmm. and aligned with a political message so it's like you know or then you even hear other guys that like if they sell gold or something and they're they're, they're gonna scare you into mm-hmm. what could potentially happen so you know so you always it's hard to find somebody that i feel gives you really good data that's not skewed to make you fear and go in one direction. Yeah, well, a couple takeaways that I thought were interesting. The, the one part where he mentioned income inequality, I had not even considered Very this. Very cool was, part. Yeah, mm-hmm. he said, you know, he goes, as societies become more advanced, uh, one reason why income inequality will always become larger is because if you are highly skilled in a modern society, the amount of productivity that you can produce is vastly higher than it than it was uh, 50 years ago when you were educated and had skills and compared to somebody who wasn't as educated or as much skills. So like today you can be and this is just efficiency. This is why the this is why the economy grows and wealth grows. Mm-hmm. You don't realize how efficient you are, but when you're working at your computer at your desk and you're highly skilled in in specific on what you do, your the productivity that you're producing is Tremendous! It's absolutely tremendous. So when you compare that person to an entry level worker, it's just vastly, uh, it's light years ahead. And then of course, when you are wealthy, your money, if it grows uh, at the same rate as somebody who's not wealthy, you still make significantly more. For example, a hundred thousand dollars growing at ten percent is uh, it's the same percent. If you grow a hundred thousand dollars at ten percent versus ten thousand dollars at ten percent. Both grow at the same percentage, but you got way more money at ten percent and a hundred thousand dollars. It's just a larger right. number. So you add those two two things up. But the other thing that he said that was really interesting was how all these, all the money that they're injecting into the economy um, through you know quantitative easing, right? That's what they call it, where they're just basically printing money to make things more what they would say liquid. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, we are going to see inflation, mm-hmm. and it's mainly going to be asset. Inflation, asset inflation. So, right. like stocks and houses, we're already seeing this. So, yeah. I really that was a, uh, a paradigm shattering moment for me because <clears throat> up until hearing him talk about this, that has been one of the things that I think uh, I've always been really fearful of and concerned. Right, and mm-hmm. I, you know, especially you talk to someone like a Peter Schiff, who's like, oh, this is how we destroy. And then when you look at history too, with all fiat money, how it's yeah, destroyed. Right. That there's this big fear around. Oh my God, we do we we infuse two trillion dollars <throat> into our economy. That's got to like just destroy the dollar. But when he when he brought into perspective what you know, and he actually predicts uh, we're going to bring it all the way up to eight trillion. So right now we're at two trillion. They're trying to pass another two mm-hmm. trillion. He believes by the end of uh, next year we'll do another two trillion. So he's saying that we'll be at eight trillion in debt, which this sounds like. Oh my God! And we we I brought up that statistic the other day of twenty two percent of the money in circulation right now in in the United States was printed this year and like mm-hmm. all that stuff scares the shit out of me like that's going to just contr- con- kill our economy it's going to kill the yeah. dollar and but when he when he talked about what that was in perspective to the GDP and what percentage of that and what that what what our total wealth creation all that stuff yeah, yeah. It, it's one percent. 
Yeah. Even mm-hmm. eight, eight trillion is one percent of the GDP every year, and what that will increase. It wasn't the month- GDP; it was a number, another number he used. But he was talking about like total production uh, aside from GDP, and I can't remember what number he used, but it was like eight hundred trillion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so the amount, and and then that's not even what the the what it would increase the the uh, yearly payment back. Yeah, because the interest rates are so low. So I, I mean, this all sounds kind of whatever. But really what this means is that money is going to be cheap to borrow for probably a long time. Mm. And what ends up happening is you start to see prices go up of certain things. And he made a really good point that it's going to be assets. So if you're listening and you want to kind of like figure out how to either invest your money or protect it, one way to kind of do this is to invest in, in assets like properties, for example, because well, those will, values will go up a lot. That was another yeah. thing that also would that this, I really love this interview. It was, I actually listened to it twice because I liked it so much. Um, you know, I I've been holding off on you know per, purchasing our own home, although we're doing investment properties so that I haven't uh, purchased our own. And one of my fears is just where the Bay Area is at. It just seems impossible. It's like there's no way these values can continue to go up, but listening to him talk <clears throat> and explain that it's almost inevitable that mm-hmm. it's going to it has to because here's the deal the one thing about the going 8 trillion in debt yeah we have the money yeah we're fine no it's not going to kill the dollar it's not even that big of a deal but somebody and something has to pay like the money has to go somewhere right. with in, it's inflation's inevitable it's just a matter of do we see the dollar just collapse or do we see things like asset inflation and who is going to pay for that back like who's going to get taxed for it yeah. and that's where the political stuff happens mm-hmm. why things take so long to get passed because there's you know you have one the conservatives and you have the liberals going no we don't want them to pay we don't want these people to pay and so that's where it's all, all about the, who pays yeah. yeah it's all who pays it's not whether we should do it or we shouldn't do it which is interesting to me because that's the argument I feel like we've been presented most of the time is like, yeah. should we or should we not do it? And doing it's just going to absolutely yeah. kill the dollar and it's going to be so bad. But it's really not about that. It's, yes, we should. Yes, we can. And yes, we will. It's mm. after it's all said and done, who's going to pay the price for, for the inflation? Did he get into cryptocurrency at all? I didn't no. make it that far. No, okay. no yeah. he didn't. It, but I'll tell you what. Um, one, I, I wish they did this. I wish it was uh, mandatory learning in high school. That you learn basic uh, investment, mm-hmm. uh, uh, basic you know interest rates and how to buy a house and what loans mean, because uh, that really hurts people. Uh, it would help our whole society if everybody was educated in that direction. It would totally, and you know it's it's. Uh, I'm trying to use an analogy I can't think of. Okay, you know what it reminds me of? Okay, when we did our our YouTube channel, the Mind Pump uh, YouTube channel. Getting to the first 10,000 subscribers was a grind. Then getting to the first 100,000 was a really hard grind. And then it accelerated after that, right? Yeah. So it's like when you're when you're dealing with your own wealth or money, that initial like getting started and kind of building, that takes a long time. But then as it starts to build momentum, mm-hmm. it happens faster and faster and faster. And it's definitely one of those things where it's better to think about it when you're young than when you're old. Like the difference of investing five years earlier versus five years later big difference. turns into millions of dollars. It's uh, all because of the, the, yeah. you brought this up the other day, the the narrative that we've been told that, you know, getting buying your own house, getting a job, right? And, and getting your 401k and setting yourself your retirement up and buying your house is like part of the American dream. It's right. like the ideal situation. And it's really not. I mean, uh, I wish I understood that. Uh, in my early 20s, when I first was making money and starting to start saving, uh, that you know, locking myself into a big mortgage and putting a down payment on a house is not necessarily the best investment for my money. And if I were to have taken that money and invested it smarter when I was younger, where it would be at today? And I think you're right, Sal. Like I, I, it, it's always blown my mind that there's not a lot uh, that was spent on this. I, I think like. Uh, Self awareness and, and and economics are two things that just are not taught to young people enough, and those two things I think have have absolutely changed who I am, the success that I've had as a person, as an individual, both financially and personally. And those things came way later in life for me. I yeah. had to go read it myself and go figure it out, where it was never it taught. Also, to me. influences your politics. Right. Which oh, is, which is a big factor. Oh, that, dude. Uh, it's hard for me to have conversations because the lack of education with, uh, you know, economics. Oh, no. If you want to be able to look behind the curtain uh, when you're in, in with politics, understand economics. Then it's yeah. much easier to see 
what's actually apples being done. Apples, yeah. yeah, what's actually being done and what's you know what's not being done and what's being <coughs> said. Um, it makes a, a really big difference. But you know, it, it really goes even this far. It's like once you understand and think about all you have to do really is just switch the way you think and think what am I getting for this money that I'm spending? Like what am I getting in return? So if you think to yourself, okay, I every morning I, I spend five dollars on a Starbucks coffee, okay? What do I get in return? Well, I get this coffee that I like, right? And that's costing me $150 a month. What if I didn't spend $150 a month on coffee? Mm. What could I get mm-hmm. for that money? And you can do it this way. You can think, what can I get for $150? What can I get for $300? That's two months worth of savings. What can I get for that whole year? And what's the value? And, and it can be as simple as this. Like if I save that much for a year, that might be able to pay for you know, uh, a small vacation. Is one vacation more valuable to me than having a Starbucks every morning where I can make coffee at home and save that 150? So it's really that mindset. That's all it is. That was the only thing I disagreed with him was, and I know you did too, because you sent me a text after you you watched it. It was the first thing you said to me. And I'm like, that's so funny because that's the one thing that I didn't agree with either, which, you know, he, he predicted everything that was going to happen right now, except for the rise in single family homes. He just didn't think that with with all the unemployment and everything that there was no way that single home prices were going to there's not going to enough be enough people that are wanting to buy. But what he attributes that to is what I disagree with. He attributes that to the uh in, unintended sen- no, savings. No, un, in, involuntary savings. Or that, yeah. In involuntary savings meaning that this these last 4 to 6 months lots of Americans were planning on Disney trips and going mm-hmm. on their vacations to Europe and so they saved all this extra money, and so they had this extra money when you know, it came time around right now to potentially buy a house. And because interest rates are so low, they said, oh, instead of, you know, we didn't spend any of that money on, on uh, traveling, so now let's buy a house. Yeah. I, don't know if, I don't know if most people, or at least most people that I know... Sure, it wouldn't I, make that big of an impact. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. Like so, at least in it's my a big leap. at least here, right? So where we live, um, and the friends that I have, like, and I, I have too. Like, so there was definitely involuntary saving for me. Like, I I don't know about you guys, but I didn't spend a lot of money in the last five four to five months. I, I saved mm-hmm. I saved more than what I would would have been able to because I'm normally traveling and doing things, but not enough to to sway yeah. me over to like, oh, now I'm going. But I also recognize. That that's where that's my circle. I'm in the Bay Area, so uh, two vacations canceled is not enough for you to have down payment. But maybe somebody in the Midwest, you know, who all every year goes to Europe or does something like that, you know, that's an extra ten or twenty thousand. Well, a hundred thousand dollar house. You only. <clears throat> what do you need? Twenty grand. Right. So, yeah. So maybe. Yeah. So so maybe you know the the like the rest of the the uh, United States. But I felt like for us, I was like that can't be yeah, true. But for yeah, us. it's that mindset, right? Yeah. It's that whole mindset. What am I getting for this? Uh, what kind of value am I getting in return? You know, like I want to buy a nice car. Is that something that I'm going to get a lot of value in, or mm-hmm. do I not really care? And would I prefer to take this money and spend it in other places? And I think if we think that way, we'll, we'll make better, healthier decisions. Um, and then, of course, the, the side effect of that is the market starts to reflect. I just it, think so. it's crazy that he he's claiming that it, the you know we're going to see an asset run the same way that we saw after 07. So in like 08, 09 with that. So we'll see stock market mm-hmm. continue to go up. Yeah, he we'll says that you know, stocks, housing, all that is going to wear, you know, office space, all those things are going to, you know, once we kind of, and he said, you know, what he can't predict is when, right? He thinks for sure all of next year we won't be back to completely normal. He says it won't be until uh, the until we're moving into 2022 before we he thinks we're going to be fully recovered. Probably because uh, I don't know if you guys are watching right now with the coronavirus. It's uh, spiking again, right? Well, it, mm. predictably, it's predictably spiking again. So I'm sure we're going to. And in Europe right now, they're starting to, to talk about lockdowns again. Yeah, and people are like, no. Yeah, wasn't he? He like telling you to pay attention to the stadiums and like the, the how full they were and whatnot to see where we were in terms of our economy. Yeah, he said, that, which I think is a great indicator, right? Like you're seventy thousand fans in a in an NFL game or whatever like that, and when you see everybody in there, and what and you know people are more comfortable. That's and that's yeah. what he what he means by that is this is that even as the economy starts to open back up. Uh, even as we get a vaccine, even as we start to get better treatments for all this, there's still going to be a lag time when everybody feels really comfortable about True. it. Like it's the, the the storm will have to have passed for some time before 
everybody comes back to normal. I mean, even myself, like I, I'm definitely not somebody who is as afraid of this, uh, the situation we're in as, as some of my friends are, but it doesn't mean I still don't take a bunch of precaution. You mm -hmm. know, I still not, I'm not going to the movie theater. I'm not going to, you know, events that are enclosed. And in fact, the other day for the first time in, you know, almost a year, I went to the mall, you know, and it was just a weird experience. Like I haven't, I haven't done something like that. And I was doing it specifically because we have Katrina's birthday coming up. So I wanted to go there. Otherwise I wouldn't be there. And so there's going to be a lot of that. There's gonna be a lot of people that are going to choose not to go to games you know because they don't need to go to games right now and so as you start to see society get more comfortable with that and when it's filled back up again he says that that will be like our indicator that it's back to normal and then we'll see everything start to re well, makes a lot of sense. now there's a there's a wrench in that too which is uh and they were talking about this the world health organization was talking about this that people are having uh like virus fatigue and i don't mean virus fatigue like they got sick and they're tired but rather they're fatigued with the fear. With the precaution. With the precaution. Everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are like, I don't care what happens right now. I don't want to go back and do the lockdowns and stuff. And and they're finding it hard. I know in Italy there were protests mm -hmm. because they they you know the cases went way down. Italy had some of the strictest lockdowns. Yeah. Now the cases are spiking like crazy. And people are like, I don't nope, we're not gonna go through with this anymore. You know, Justin, you brought up the NFL. Did you see Juve signed with the Niners? I did see that. I was and super excited. I was like, uh on on the Niners, I actually saw them post about it on Instagram. I got like excited, commented on there. But they have they're the first NFL team to actually adopt uh Juve red light as is a as a valid recovery in therapy. And so they have it all set up. So they got these big panels uh, after they go through their workout. They go through their practice. They can go stand uh, in front of these panels and you know oh. get the active recovery. From there it, it is, right oh, there. Look sick. at that. Okay. It's so badass, dude. It, it, okay, so it legit works. I know it sounds crazy. Oh, you it, wouldn't see an NFL team doing it if it didn't. Yeah, right. They're always on cutting edge stuff, right? It, it, for no, it for real works. In fact, there was a study. I'm going to pull it up here. So they did a study. So all the studies so far that I've seen um, on something like skin, right? People will use red light therapy. They'll do it two days a week or three days a week. And a dramatic, a, a big majority of them will say that they noticed uh, significant changes in their skin. Or the scientists will say their skin looks a lot better. But it's all, I mean, that sounds very subjective, right? My skin looks better. Your skin looks better. Mm -hmm. So they did one study where they actually tested the, uh, the, the, the density of collagen. So they did a study. It's, they used ultrasonograph. Uh, they did an ultrasound and they measured the density of collagen in someone's skin. So they had a bunch of people you do red light therapy, like the Juve, two days a week. So they didn't even use it every single day, two days a week. And there was a significant increase in collagen density in wow. the skin. So it legit, it legit works. So things for like, uh, you know, stretch marks, scars, wrinkles. And then, uh, you know, is as it goes in deeper in the body, it improves recovery, which is why you see athletes using that stuff, you know, more and more. I'm so, so proud. Really of crazy. The, I'm so, so awesome. proud of the partners that we've decided to work with. It's, pretty, <laughs> it's really cool right now. Like it's, um, it feels good to see uh, them get like this stuff, right? Like we, when you talk about, I mean, we've been with Juve now for over two and a half, three years now. Yeah. yeah. So, and I remember when we first met him and we learned all about it, like, so it was very cool to see, you know, we were the first podcast. They were, we were like their first advertising. They weren't even doing any advertising when mm -hmm. we first uh, linked up with them to see what they're doing, what uh, Viore's doing, what Felix Gray is doing. Yeah, like yeah. Magic Spoon. I was going to bring them up and on my night by myself, you know, like <laughs> I got to like treat, have a treat. And it was like nice because I could just go grab a bowl and sit and watch. I watched a Deadpool 2 and I was eating some blueberry. And But I saw, I got an email. They have two new flavors. You guys even Again? know about these? Dude. Yeah. Yeah, they, they did another poll, and I guess that they concluded that people really wanted to see if they could have apple cinnamon and uh, salted caramel, Ooh, which I was like, salted caramel. caramel, oh my God, I was, like I started drooling. You guys are, like, you guys turn into, like, two teenage stoners when your wife <laughs> hey, I told, He's the one with the bong. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you were still watching TV with a big bowl of cereal? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I had an edible, so uh, <laughs> I was feeling it, too. Yeah, that's just, hilarious. Yeah, things we do when the wives are gone, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, that is so funny. I actually didn't have it last night, but I mean, I also got filled up on a burger. I haven't had burger and fries in a long time, so I was I was filled up on it. But I mean, after that, I mean, the last time we talked about Magic's 
tablespoon, I'm still blown away by the macro breakdown when you eat the whole box. Yeah. You know, by no by by the way, okay. I'm that's not, not recommended. I can't not find somebody that doesn't like it. it yeah. it's, it's crazy. No, uh, yeah. I haven't met anybody who hasn't either. So you're eating the whole box, huh? No, that was at one time, dude. So I'm not okay, I don't want to promote that, right? So I don't I don't think that's seven hundred and seventy calories. Seven hundred and seventy calories in like what was it, nine seventy seven seventy one grams of protein? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Now are you what did you get where do you get your burger from? Five guys. Oh, it's always five guys. No, not always. I mean, if I, so, In and Out doesn't deliver uh, on DoorDash, or else I would do In and Out. But In and Out doesn't do that. You know, you know we that? had. You know, we. Had, I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, we had last night. Do hmm. uh, you guys ever eat uh, Peruvian food? There's a. Yeah. Did you? There's one over by the. No. The what? mall. The one. One of the. What does that look like? One over by the uh, mall. That's amazing. Over by Valley Fair. Is it the? Uh, is it off uh, of West? Uh, off of. Um, God, I can't think of the street right I now. I think that's the place that we always go. Yeah, that's the one that's well. So there's a dish there. called Lomo Soltaldo. Do you get, is that the one? Is you that get? that like the steak and potatoes and so like there's like steak, carrots. there's uh, French fries, yeah, yeah, rice, yeah, 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 yeah. and this That's like my favorite dish, this like brown sauce, so, and, so and good. It, but it's like comfort food, dude. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so we had that last night. Oh, it's yeah. good fall food. Oh, bro, yeah. I crushed. Did you have it delivered or did you go there? No, they were closed. So I found another. So we actually. So here's the deal. Okay. Pregnant wife had a craving, so we drove an hour away and went up to Redwood City. That's right. You're bound to that. Your family. You did. That's like you drove law. an hour to go get it. We almost right. So Redwood City. So it took us like forty something minutes. Oh so my yeah, god! And we we had some. Uh, some oh, that's, that's hilarious. Yeah. I just have. I you know what? I actually haven't even asked you about her. Has she had any weird real cravings? Is she uh, doing something? You know, let me try and think right now. Katrina yeah. was crazy with the oranges, dude. Okay, so here's a weird one. So she never. I didn't know this about her. She would never had kiwis before. In her life. Never had kiwi. Oh. So she was sitting there one day. This was like, I want to say a month and a half or two months ago. She said she was at home and she just got a craving. This I, is what's weird about it. I love kiwis. For kiwis. But she's never had them before. So she was at home, had a craving for kiwis, had to drive to Whole Foods and buy- Did she buy. see a commercial or anything? Or this was just like a random thought? It's so weird that yeah. her brain literally said to her, the, this food you've never had before is what you crave. That is so That's strange. That is bizarre. That's so, how the oranges kind of work for Katrina. Katrina never ate. I've never seen Katrina eat an orange. But at least she's she tasted an orange. Right, right, of course. It's not that foreign to her. So she went to the store and bought kiwi, like the sliced kiwis at Whole Foods. Yeah, so good. And it totally hit the craving, and then she'd eat them every day wow. basically since, which I thought was- what a trip. Very, very, very strange. Never ate them before. So. Oh, that's wild. First question is from Kai Lovecraft. What do you think about plyometrics? How can I incorporate plyometrics and functional training into my routine? This is right after uh, geometry and algebra. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I know. It sounds I was, also like a I was, supplement. I was, I was terrible at this. I'm yes. taking a lot of plyometrics. Yeah, absolutely terrible. Big. Yeah, no. You know what's funny? My, my mind has, has changed a little bit on this uh, relatively recently, uh, talking to our good friend uh, Joe DeFranco. Mm -hmm. And of course, like anything, right? And this makes perfect sense. Like anything, there's varying degrees of how you can apply it and how hard you do it, right? So like if someone says, what do you think about heavy lifting? Well, heavy lifting is all relative. It depends on the person who's doing it and what the context is. And what might be heavy for my grandmother is obviously going to be very light for me. Uh, but challenging the body that way, there's going to be benefits. Same thing with plyometrics. And what he said to me was, which rang totally true is if you stop training a particular skill, you'll eventually lose that skill. Now I've experienced that myself. Yeah. You don't use it, you lose it. I have. I've experienced it myself where I go to the park and you know I'm playing frisbee with my kid and I go to jump and twist and mm -hmm. I feel like it's not I'm not moving like I think I could. And it's because I haven't trained jumping or twisting or those type of explosive movements. So plyometrics, from a health standpoint, train them appropriately and properly is to be able to maintain that kind of movement. If you want to be able to, you know, if you if you miss a step and catch yourself or if you want to jump off the curb or jump down uh, off of the, you know, the, the, the back of your truck or you want to, you know, reach up and grab something real quick because someone throws something at you or whatever, plyometrics helps you maintain that ability. Now, from an advanced point of view, uh, plyometrics improves explosive power and plyometrics activate fast twitch muscle fibers better than almost any other form of training. Now, why is that why is that important? Well, fast twitch muscle fibers are the muscle fibers that grow and build. And so if you're just interested in overall fitness and want to build muscle, so long as it's done appropriately, plyometrics will 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 send a, a very loud and different signal to the muscles to build and grow. Well, it's also about maintaining abilities. Like and, and I know that uh, not everybody wants to be an athlete. Not everybody wants to uh, be able to uh, 
uh, move super explosively and sprint on command or slow down really e- efficiently and effectively and change directions. But um, it, you can take elements of that to your average person and really benefit uh, their lifestyle uh, substantially. So like you give examples of when you're reaching back for a car really quickly to, you know, brace something or, uh, you know, somebody, something falls from a shelf and you have to react like super aggressively. And if you don't have, if your body doesn't recognize how to react in a situation like that, this is just one of those instances where you will uh, suffer the consequences of that. The The body's going to have to adjust and react how it's going to adjust. And a lot of times it, it, it will get injured as a result because you're, you're neglecting this side of training, which is definitely a component. The other thing to plyometrics uh, to, to consider, I mean, this is, this is one of those where it's, it's at the pinnacle of your training in terms of like what attributes you're trying to, uh, achieve. And so I look at it as, you know, this is sort of like a testing grounds. Like, even if it's just like your average person that's been training their way up, uh, the rungs to get to a certain point where now if you move explosively, you have to have put in all that groundwork to be able to stabilize and and get your body under control as quickly as you're able to uh, explosively move into that position. So it's it's a good test uh, as well. I've always thought that plyometrics belong in programming. I just think that they've been poorly done. That's all. Yeah, no one does them right. Yeah, sure. I, I definitely think they belong in. I think they belong in somewhat in everybody's routine. Uh, and when you don't, I mean, I, I experienced. Uh, I think I've shared on this podcast at least once or twice the story of me jumping out of the back of my my bed of my truck. Uh, that that was the first kind of rude awakening for myself. That oh wow, I've really neglected this type of training. I did a lot of it in my twenties. Uh, and even like into uh, my early 30s, right before competing, competing really, I became so focused on aesthetics that I completely eliminated plyometrics in my training. It wasn't a goal. It wasn't a, a focus of mine. And I really didn't see uh, the consequences of that until that day. Like it hadn't registered. I hadn't had a, t- a moment or a time. I wasn't playing basketball at the time. Uh, I hadn't done anything explosively. That was the first time I had called on my body to do something that I believed I could easily do. And I jumped down from the truck, and I was I was fine, but boy, it, it felt like somebody took a baseball bat to my knees, uh, and I was like, whoa, and I was like, well, this is what I get. When was the last time, you know, Adam, you did a you know you know jump off of a box or jump up to a box? And when I thought about, it, I was like, man, it's been five six years since I've done something like that, and that inspired me to get back into incorporating it into my training. Now, it doesn't mean that you like my training also turns into this you know, explosive plyometric circuit based lifting routine all the time just means like, hey, I need to have some jump boxes in there or where you step down from a jump box and and work on the deceleration of the of the squat or the jump or some sort of explosive lateral movements with the tube or something like that, because you don't want, like Justin alluded to, you don't want to lose it. If you don't want to lose those abilities on things that you may do in real life, then yeah, then it belongs in the program. It, I just... We need to talk about how it's poorly programmed. And the way it's poorly programmed most commonly is people do it to fatigue. And that's not the idea. The idea is that you want to be able to be be comfortable. Justin gave the analogy of reaching back to the car real quick or something falling off a shelf and then being able to react. So when you do that, you don't do that 15 repetitions or 30 repetitions. Like you do that one time, you know, it happens and then you, you have to be able to do it. So that's how you should emulate it in your training one to three reps. And there should be plenty of rest in between. And it's all about the movement of it. And then there's prerequisites before you do that. If you can't step up onto a box with beautiful form, you shouldn't jump up onto a box. That should be the first and foremost. You should be able to step up onto a box with good technique, good stability, good form, good control, and then the progression of that is the the ability to be able to jump up onto the box with good form. And then when you finally get to that place where you're jumping up on the box, you don't need to be doing 10 to 15 reps in a circuit-based type of routine or with low rest periods. You do three to five jump boxes and you rest in between every rep and you and you'd be very meticulous about how you move and you and, and how you land and how you take off. And that's where the emphasis is put when you put it into your program. So Yes, I, I think uh, plyometrics, fi- functional training, uh, belongs in everybody's routine, no matter the age, 
but the way you apply it into there really depends on their level. Have they done the prerequisites to get to that point? And then to make sure if you're somebody who is not an athlete and it's not a high priority that you just intermittently introduce it into your routine enough that you don't lose it. Like that's uh, the two common mistakes that I see when you see people talking about or utilizing plyometrics. Next question is from Lisa J. Kennedy, 75. Do deadlifts give you a thicker midsection? I love doing them and have gained a great deal of strength in my back from them. However, as a female, I worry that my midsection is thicker as a result. This is another one of these myths that are out there. I hate this one. Yeah. This one really makes me upset. So first of all, um, you don't want to look at the extreme top lifters of any sport and look at their physique and judge their physique and say, oh, that's why their physique necessarily looks that way. First off, people who can deadlift ungodly amounts of weight naturally probably already have thicker waists, okay? And eat tons of it, food. Yeah, <laughs> and they, yeah. many of them may be on anabolic steroids. Yeah. There's lots of muscle lots being of built. Factors there. Here's the deal. If you want a smaller waist, get leaner. Even if you develop the muscles around your waist, you're not going to develop a much thicker waist. You might get, I don't know, a couple centimeters of thickness around in terms of lean muscle, around the waist, but you're going to appear leaner and more sculpted. Uh, it's th This myth makes me upset because people tend to neglect training the muscles around the core, like the obliques, yeah. because they're afraid they're going to get a thicker waist. And in, what ends up happening is they lose function, they lose strength. And the truth is, if you're lean, your waist is going to be small. And if you have muscle around your waist and you're lean, not only are you going to have a small waist, it's going to look more impressive. I, I think this is like uh, I think of um, when when I was competing, like mm -hmm. we were, you know, constant uh, constantly focusing on building like my shoulders and the width of my back to give this uh, illusion that my my waist is smaller, even though my waist wasn't technically really shrinking, right? So I, I if you are are training the obliques, you're training exercises that may even thicken. Like who cares if it puts on a quarter inch on your uh, on your waist, but puts three inches on the the width of your back, the ratio, you know, when you look in the mirror or somebody else looks at you, will look as if your waist is smaller. And it'll it'll look more shapely too. So man, adding a half inch yeah. to your waist of muscle is a lot, by the way. Yeah, people yeah, don't yeah. realize that doesn't those, happen. Yeah, exactly. Those are exaggerated numbers. Yeah. It's very, very unlikely you would even do that. But I'm saying even if you did do that, uh, it's a lot easier to add that width to the top of your body, to the tops of your shoulder caps and the width of your back. So the, as long as that ratio either stays the same or it increases because you've built your back up and your shoulders, it's going to give the illusion of your waist being even tighter or smaller. I also think this, there's a point to address here about uh, training with and without the belt. Mm -hmm. uh, Sal, you talk a lot about uh, you know training with a belt. You train your core and midsection to do something different than what you do if you train without a belt. You know, If you go to a deadlift and you don't wear a belt, you have to think about like the vacuum pose. You, you end up you know, your transverse abdominus, you, you contract inward, inward, and you tighten up and you shrink the waist to be tighter and stiff around your spine for when you lift. If you always wear a belt when you deadlift, you actually train the core to push out. So if you are concerned about your waist looking smaller, staying tighter, staying in, that's a suggestion I would have also is don't deadlift with a belt all the time. Deadlift without a belt. Teach, uh, Train your, your, your TVA to draw in and actually shrink your waist versus using a belt where you're pushing your waist out against the belt. Yeah, this is an interesting one because it keeps getting perpetuated. Even like I'll hear this even from Courtney sometimes about like, you know, doing something too often that will promote like a boxier kind of look that uh, I've, I've heard this is a common uh, concern with a lot of females that I've trained even. And it's, again, to the point that you're not going to be building, it's really difficult to build like a substantial amount of, of size, uh, you know, in your core uh, to begin with. Most of, the, most of the ways that you're going to train your core are going to be to brace. And so everything's like working its way to protect. Uh, and it's essential for you to work in that area to uh, have that function, because if you're still working out, that's really what's protecting you. And that's what's keeping everything uh, moving forward in 
the right direction long term. So to neglect that area, you're going to run into all kinds of problems uh, down the road. And honestly, like there's there are different styles of training that will produce different looks. Right. So I know you guys speak to this a lot more from the aesthetic side uh, in terms of being able to focus on bringing up and developing other muscles to then sort of balance the overall aesthetic uh, to, to provide, uh, you know, whatever that sort of V taper or whatever you guys call it kind of look, uh, you know, they're going for it's, it's, it's just a problem because this, this has created a market for like corsets and, and for all these like, like Screams. really horrible. Yeah. Ideas that, uh, people are still gravitating towards that because it's, you know, they're not considering the body as a whole. It's silly. It's silly. You know, it's funny too. Um, considering the muscles that you develop and the muscles that, that, uh, women and men want to develop, the deadlift is a excellent, phenomenal exercise for women. Oftentimes, female clients would say they want to develop their hamstrings and their glutes. They like well-developed lower backs. So if you want to stand up tall in a bikini, not just have good glutes, but have that nice lower back where you see the indentation come in a little bit, that's deadlifts. Yeah. I've never trained any female ever who got really good at deadlifts who came back at me and said, I don't like the way yeah. my body looks. They've all fallen in love with the deadlift. So mm. it's this is so silly to me. This is a myth perpetuated by extreme bodybuilding, in which case I would not take much of their advice because it doesn't apply to most people. In fact, it's it's unhealthy advice for most people, mm -hmm. men and women. It's even bad for bodybuilding. Yeah. I used to scoff at all my peers that that thought this way. I deadlifted all the way up into competition day. Yeah. I mean, and to your point about the back, I mean, you your erector spinae looks kind of like abs on your back. So doing things like deadlifting gives you this this great definition. It creates those canals and that little dip. So even if it added again a quarter inch to your waist, you'll have this illusion of it dipping in and being more aesthetically pleasing. So don't eliminate that exercise in fear of adding a little bit to your waist. That's a ridiculous notion that's been, I think, been perpetuated way too long. Yeah, I think they're canals. Is it canals or canals? Well, let's go with canals. canals. What did I say? What did I say? Canals. Canals? Can canals. 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 More of a now? It's like pillow, yeah. pillow. I got canals. my lisp in going on over here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. De <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Put that in the library. Next question is from GD Penna. Is it truly necessary to take one rest day a week? For instance, how about alternating between full bo body strength days and cardio? No, it's not necessary to take one day off a week. It is necessary to modify your intensity and activity mm. to allow your body to rest and recover. However, uh, under most circumstances, um, your body recovers better when it's active than if you're just sitting around laying in bed. Yeah. Now, this was, uh, you know, I believe this, uh, the opposite to be true when I was younger because I thought, oh, I have to like totally rest so my muscles can recover. So I would like have this crazy hard workout and then I'd come home and sit on the couch purposely and be like, don't move, let the muscles build. <laughs> let them grow. Yeah, it doesn't work. In fact, not being active can hamper recovery and can cause the opposite to happen. When you don't move, you're sending a signal to your body that says, we don't need muscle, we don't need strength, we don't need fitness. But you do need to modify your intensity. You can't train super hard all the time. Of course, this is, depends on the individual and their, their fitness level and their recovery. But you can't push your body to its limits all the time, day in and day out, because you will run into problems. But you can totally be active every day. In fact, I feel my best and I recover my best when I'm active every single day. What does that look like for me? Three, typically three heavy workouts a week, two lighter workouts workouts a week and then two days a week where I'm doing things like walking and hiking and maybe mobility work and playing with my kids at the park and that kind of stuff. But I don't have necessarily days where I'm like no activity, yeah. no exercise. I need to recover Netflix unless, I've, unless I've really overdone it. And I feel like I'm on the on the verge of getting ill, in which case I will not do anything. I love the idea of you know going to the gym seven days a week. I just uh, not just because uh, I think I felt my best during those times too, and I'm not right now, by the way. It's uh, and I'm also not nowhere near the best shape of my life right now. I think that uh, for the for the mental reason uh, for creating a good habit, I like to teach clients this, like just. You make you carve an hour out a day that is your day to work on yourself. That's just it. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, like to Sal's point, you you modify the intensity. It doesn't working out or exercising for your for your health or for overall performance, whatever you're looking for, 
uh, doesn't have to look like hammering the weights every single time to the gym. You know, like you said, three to four days of, of a, a good, you know, intense workout is more than enough. And then doing cardio on the off days or mobility or taking a hike or doing yoga and working inward. Like I, I like the idea of teaching clients to have that five to seven days where they just, they know, Hey, every day at this time for this hour, I carve that out for my time to go to my gym or work out in my garage, wherever you do it at. And you just modify it based off of what you've been doing. If you had a real heavy lifting day the day before, well, okay, well then today do more mobility, stretching or cardio type activity, and then go back to a heavy lifting day. I, I like that. And I've, I've found, I've had the most success that way. And I found my clients that I encourage to go to the gym that often have a lot of success. Now, that's not to be said that you can't only train, you know, you could train two days a week and only train two days a week and build a decent physique if you mm -hmm. have very good discipline with your eating and your, your calorie balance. Um, you could build a decent amount of muscle. You can burn a decent amount of fat and, and shape a decent body only going to the gym two times a week. But I think that it's more consistent and you get more bang for your buck just getting in the habit and the routine of always having that hour of exercise just changing and modifying it yeah like sal kind of said in the beginning about uh, working out really hard and then having to dedicate like a whole day of just rest and not movement like i used to run by that especially on the weekends which is then gonna leave me open to you know the weekends you make decisions where you're gonna eat a bit more calories you're not paying attention to all these things you're 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 resting right so so th this is where all the the magic happens, where you're, you're building muscle. But it it it, it took me to the point where I would get to Monday's workout and I would have zero motivation. I did not want to move, and I had to overcome every week. I had to overcome this uh, th this this sort of block that I put in front of me in terms of being able to now generate that type of momentum to get to produce a better workout again, and then repeat the cycle all over again. And it wasn't until I, I realized, I mean, I just got to keep moving and, and, and do lighter amounts. And even if that means scaling my workout back a bit of intensity wise, uh, and then moving again the second day and not doing quite what I did the first day, uh, my body just felt better. I was, I was more energized. I was, I felt more recovery and it's just a, it's a way better strategy than to really hammering the body and then like resting completely. Dude, totally. Uh, you know, Four moderate intensity workouts is better than two super high intensity workouts if you on a long term basis. Um, you know that's just true, right? Daily activity is best, but you got to moderate the intensity so that your body can handle it. Next question is from Cat Ill Est. My nephew is seven and is showing interest in weightlifting. Where is a good place to start? What exercises or routines would you recommend? Gymnastics. Yeah. That's right. At seven years old, what you're looking to develop is coordination. Body and, awareness. And body awareness. And you, they can get it with weights. It's going to be really, really hard. Here's the problem with weights and seven. I've trained kids that are real young. I've even trained kids as young as seven or eight years old. And it's literally 10 minutes. That's about as long as you can keep their attention. And it turns into games, which gymnastics is a lot of. You know, when you when you see seven year olds engage in gymnastics, it's games, it's tumbling, it's fun. Plus, they're maneuvering their own bodies and they're getting more body awareness. Weights will help do that as well, but it doesn't do it nearly as well as gymnastics will, especially not for a seven year old. And trying to get a seven year old to handle a weight, mm. uh, you know, above their head, it's not going to work. It's hard to find dumbbells small enough. Um, it just it just doesn't work as well. Typically with weights, I start around 12 or 13. But before that, it's like, you know, it's body weight stuff, you know, lunges and squats and push-ups and tumbling and handstands and planks and climbing. Climbing is great. Games where they're yeah, they don't balance, even, balancing. Oh, oh my God, I did this with my daughter. Uh, so she's 10 and I, I go out in the garage and I'm going to train my son who's 15. So I can train him straight up. We're going to do exercises. Sometimes with her, I got to trick her a little bit. So what I did with her is I had her come out. She's like, I don't want to work out. I'm like, no problem. Uh, you don't need to work out. Just hang out with us. And then I got the physio ball down and I said, hey, I bet you can't sit on this imbalance without your feet touching the floor. She's like, yeah, I can. I said, I bet you can. If you do it for 30 seconds, I'll give you 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. So she, for literally 45 minutes, she sat on the physio ball and tried to balance. About 45 minutes later, she stops and she goes, my core is really sore. And she goes, 
did you trick me into working out my core? <laughs> no, you're just playing. Yeah. You know, gymnastics does a really, really good job of doing this for young yeah, kids. I definitely, uh, that's a hundred percent. And that's why I, I enrolled my kids in like a parkour and gymnastic. And it's just so good for them to learn uh, how their body moves, how to adjust, how to, how to react when uh, you know, they're, they're opposing all these different forces from different angles. I think that's just like essential to build off of that uh, body awareness because because then they're in their body and you can really teach them now how to utilize and shuttle uh, the right amount of force in certain uh, directions. So they they're efficient in what they're doing uh, with their body. And, and one thing that I do apply with my kids that we talk about all the time on the show is to provide opportunities for them when they see something that they just, they just see like a pull up bar or they see hanging rings like in my house and they just go and do a pull up. It just, maybe it's one, maybe it's three, but it's always there. And every time they walk past it, they do it. And it's been really fascinating to watch. Uh, my my oldest now can do like 10 pull-ups in a row. He, wow, he couldn't good. even barely do one. Yeah. And it, he, it, it's those concepts we talk about. It, it works. And it works with young kids like that. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to teach them all the mechanics of, you know, the perfect squat just yet, especially at seven. Uh, you know, you can model that for them so they start to watch dad or mom do these exercises but honestly it's just it's, it's providing the environment and the structure for them to uh, express their body the way it needs to and, and they, they learn for themselves which then promotes you know like excitement and energy towards building on that so i hated training kids so i'll tell you what not to do you know so the, <laughs> the things not to do the mistakes that i made uh, early on trying to train you know young kids so even though i i, I say uh, with tongue in cheek, that I hated training kids. I trained a lot of kids, um, I, I, and I didn't enjoy it a lot at the beginning because I think I overcomplicated the process. Um, I, I was trying to get these kids to focus for, like, to Sal's point, yeah, for you know, yeah. sixty minutes of a workout. You know what I'm saying? Or I was, or to Justin's point, I was really trying to get them to do a squat perfect or a bicep curl perfect, and really get them to understand the form and hold their body there. And I, I would get frustrated because they would get impatient with it. They wouldn't like doing it. And it just felt like I was wasting their time and my time. And I think when I kind of let go of all of that and stopped looking at the way I would train a beginner client and training kids is different. And just if I could get them to do stuff that I would know would promote uh, good body awareness, good strength, good balance. So that, I started doing different things. I, in fact, I was just playing with my niece who's eight years old. And uh, and I was with my eight, my niece was eight year old uh, eight year old niece and then I have a nephew who's thirteen, and uh, she has the ability to sit down in a squat uh, really well, mm. and so we were all sit sitting in you know my my squat and scroll position and I was with her and I was like can you get down here with me and she's like okay so she can do it and then I'm like okay can you kick your leg out from down here? And so then I would have her and she'd like fall over a couple of times. I'm like, you could, and she'd almost be able to, and she kept practicing it. Then she could get it. And I got her to be able to do that. I said, okay, can you now take one leg while you're bouncing and then bring it back in and then now switch to the other leg. And then so we messed around with that. That took like 10, 15 minutes for her to get that down. Then she got that down and said, okay, now can you, kick the leg out, balance, and stand up from that position, you know? And then it took us another 10 to 15 minutes for her to get that. And, you know, before you know it, her and I are fooling around for 30 minutes trying to do an exercise. Meanwhile, working on her stability, working on her strength is overall going to make her better at squatting. And she's having fun. We're playing with it. We're enjoying yeah. it. When I started thinking more like that, right? And I think, Sal, you've, you've uh, alluded to one that I've done uh, similar. I didn't use pencils, but I think you've used a pencil one where you throw a bunch of pencils on the ground and you try and see you know, how many can they pick up without tipping over or falling over. Can they get all 25 or 30 pencils on the ground? Yeah, while balancing on one yeah, leg. While balancing on one leg, and then you make them switch to the other side, which you'll see there'll be a discrepancy. Most kids right away will have one side they have good stability on, the other side they won't so much. And so playing games like that or, you know, having them j jump to a, a single leg balance, right? Jump from one spot and then try and balance on one leg. So doing exercises and movements like that, body weight push-ups and like Justin alluded mm -hmm. to, pull-ups, you know, j and, or even just hangs. You know, how long can you hang for? Grabbing yeah. a, a b rings or gra grabbing a bar and, you know, I bet you can't hold this for 30 seconds. You know, if you can, I'll give you this or I'll challenge you to that. And mm -hmm. so I, I think uh, when I started to piece that together – that I'm never going to get this kid to do three sets of 15 bicep curls and then five sets of squats. You know, like I let go of all that shit and just said, hey, if I could just get this kid 
to work on their balance and stability a little bit and their and their proprioception, their body awareness. Um, I, I, that's a great foundation. And you you said it perfect. I think Sal said this that you know gymnastics. That's I'm I for sure. The I think two years old is when I can first enroll Max in that, and a hundred percent. Uh, I will put him in gymnastics just because I think just for that reason. It's not that I hope that he becomes some you know major gymnast one day. I just I understand that that's probably one of the best things that you could take a kid through uh, to lay the foundation for any and all other sports pursuits, including weightlifting. Totally. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. Also, come check us out on Instagram. You got to check out Doug. He does a lot of behind the scenes stuff. So if you want to learn about podcasting or see what kind of socks Adam wears when we podcast, um, check him out. Go to uh, Doug's Instagram page, Mind Pump Doug. You can also find your hosts on Instagram. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Yeah. And so I'm taking the test and doing the whole thing, and I'm working in the bank. And and I found myself, uh, half the time I was in the bank, talking to people about fitness, talking to people about nutrition, giving people workouts, my coworkers, the, the people coming into the bank, like this is what I was talking about.